Welcome back, guys, to another wonderful episode of Ellis and I talking about all things wealth related. Um, Today's topic is really super exciting because we're going to be talking about a book that has really helped transform our relationship with money, uh, spiritual relationship with money, our mental, emotional relationship with money. And that is a book called Secrets of a Millionaire Mind. So today, Ellis and I are going to dissect our um, key points, key secrets. There are 17 in total. We're not going to go over all 17 with you guys, but we will highlight our favorite three. So you ready? I sure am. Are you ready? (laughs) This guy. So number five, rich people focus on opportunities, poor people focus on obstacles. I think one of the biggest things with Ellis and I when we first started was um, not being buried under a pool of obstacles. Sometimes in the beginning, little money, little resources, um, little network, little knowledge on how wealth is built. What is wrong with you? (laughs) Nothing. What's going on with you? I'm listening to you. I'm enamored by your beauty. This is why when you are in business with your spouse, it can be so annoying (laughs) sometimes. However, I appreciate you and you look really nice today. It's nice to get a compliment every now and then. (laughs) So let's talk about in the beginning, focusing on obstacles more than opportunities. What do you think? um, What was that like for us? Because in the beginning, we didn't look at opportunity and hidden inside of every obstacle. Sometimes we would allow distractions, obstacles, dilemmas um, to really get us off centered. And sometimes we would lose weeks and months trying to solve a problem instead of working around the problem. I think one of those obstacles is uh, communication, right? Uh, not being able to communicate properly, you know, can have us, uh, had us upset, not wanting to do anything for a week, you know, just saying, forget about it. Uh, obstacles would be like, you know, the kid got something going on after school. You know, one of the biggest things we always talk about is like the reason why can't be, your reason why can't be your biggest uh, reason why you don't do something. Like you can't say, oh, I wanna do this for my kids, but my kids are the reason why I can't do something because I gotta pick them up. I gotta make sure they do their homework. I gotta make sure they, you know, get fed, things of that nature, you know? So that can be an obstacle or, you know, just time management is another obstacle too as well. Yeah, I I agree. I actually do think those were our two biggest obstacles in the beginning, communication and time management. Um, And we're still learning how to be better communicators with each other because not only are we business partners, we're husband and wife, we're parenting our children, we are building a legacy, giving back to our community. We do so much together. In the beginning, it was like excruciating, having to learn how you communicate, you having to learn how I communicate, making sure nobody's feeling disrespected, feeling whatever it may be. So something I know that we've learned is hidden inside of every single obstacle is this opportunity. You just, sometimes you just gotta dig beyond the obstacle to grab hold of it. But that opportunity for you to grow, become more patient, become a better learner, become a better leader, become a better spouse, um, is so much treasure hidden inside of every obstacle. And I think you and I have just learned how to grab hold of the treasure faster. Yeah, you know, just really understanding that the obstacle is the way. Yep, that's another great book. The Obstacle is the Way, that's another exceptional book. But tell me what's your, I guess, one of the many different secrets of a millionaire mind that stood out to you? One I love right here is rich people believe I create my life and poor people believe life happens to me. And so, <laughs> Um, This is something that resonates so well with me because uh, that's really victim mindset. Uh, We speak upon that a lot for entrepreneurs is how you overcome the victim mindset. And it's really been programmed into each and every one of us, especially from a young upbringing. Uh, And that's inundated from our our, uh, schooling, 
our education system teaches us that, you know, a lot of things happen to you, right? You can't really create your own way. You know, sometimes our teachers in the beginning and first grade say, hey, what do you want to be? You can be anything you want to be. And then after a while, they start telling you, yeah, right, kid, that, that's really not going to happen. Uh, but coming from a different society, uh, a society of rich people, you know, they don't think that way, right? They don't think that life happens to them. They go take life by the horns and make things happen. And so once we begin to get around people who thought differently, then we were able to become more successful because we no longer felt like, hey, everything is just happening to me, right? Not only is that power of association, but you talked about schools. A lot of your relationship with money is learned through your family. A lot of how you view wealth and finances, you learn that. For example, I grew up in an environment in my family where you are told Republicans are greedy, Republicans are mean, Republicans are racist, and Democrats are the nice people, the servants. Um, they are the modest people, the humble people. And I've met some arrogant Democrats. I've met some arrogant Republicans. I've met some broke Democrats. I've met some wealthy Democrats, right? I think that a lot of our relationship with money, we inherit from our parents' trauma. And so it's incredibly important to make sure that you do the work, that you actually do the work to step outside of what other people tell you and develop your own relationship with money. Um, and it, it took a while for you and I to really come to terms with like, who do we want to be at the bank? You know, I think that's uh, that's so powerful. Just who do we want to be? And, you know, not just have somebody tell us something, you know. I mean, I remember quite frankly, my grandmother flat out told me coming up, we vote for Democrats because Democrats are for black people. <laughs> that, that was my understanding of politics. And that was it. And I followed that mantra for a long time. Um, and so this is, by the way, guys, this is not a conversation about Democrats or Republicans. It was, it's the fact that we've just been taught to think a certain way instead of doing our own research, right? And so I'm independent. I think for myself. I don't let one person tell me because I believe all of them crooked, right? They're not out for the best interests of the everyday hardworking American people. Uh, you have to be in the best interests of yourself and your family. I don't think all of them are. <laughs> They're all crooked. <laughs> But, 90 percent of them. Oh, gosh. So um, the, the next one for me, secret that stands out is really talking about the power of your associations. And I'm actually going to read that verbatim. Rich people associate with positive, successful people. Poor people associate with negative, unsuccessful people. And the reason why this is one of my favorite is because sometimes just by hearing that, immediately some of you are probably thinking, man, that sounds really harsh because that's making the assumption that all poor people are negative or all rich people are positive. While I absolutely don't agree with that statement, I do, however, agree in the power of your association. In this day and age, who are you aligned with? If we were to examine the five people you talk to the most, right now, if you were to go pull up your text thread, pull up your social media feed, pull up your call log, do the five people you talk to the most every single day make more money than you, make less money than you, or are, at they, are they at the same income bracket as you? That will tell you your identity because eventually when you, consistently speak with people who make more money than you, it's the law of attraction. That's another book by John Maxwell, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. But in, in, when you talk to people who make more money than you, essentially and eventually, they will pull your income up because your income will never outgrow your identity. And that's incredibly important to understand. And it took a while for me to, to get, to understand that habit because sometimes you don't wanna come off as a sellout or feel like you're leaving your friends and family members behind and the people that you grew up with and the people who knew you when you were dirt poor and the people who you used to have to borrow money from to feed your children. But the only difference is eventually one of you said, I gotta get off this train. 
This train is no longer serving me and my family. I got to do something different. And yeah, that may look like a decade of me going in the opposite direction. And yeah, right now you may be in a season where everybody around you is winning and you're wondering, Lord, God, when will it be my time? But trust me when I tell you, you get into an environment where people are aligned with your core values. They're making more money than you. Eventually, you will begin to mirror their habits. You will, you will mirror their financial habits, their marital habits, their spiritual habits. And so that law of association, law of attraction has really allowed you and I to triple our income. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the next thing uh, I hop into uh, is rich people play the game to win and poor people play the game to not to lose. All yeah, right. And so when I first read that, I was like, what does that mean? You know, I looked into it a little bit more and I was like, I'm sat with it, thought about it. Um, but one of the things that rich people do is that they learn the rules to the money game. How does money actually work? How does the banking system actually work? What is the true intention of money? Uh, true intention of money is that you're supposed to continually to make more of it to combat one word, which is inflation, right? Let your money work for you to build more of it. And mo most of the time, what we're doing in middle market America, impoverished neighborhoods, is that we're just trading our time for a dollar, a salary, you know, hourly wage, that's it. You know, trying not to lose, which means that we are just trying to make sure that we pay our, our rent. We are just trying to make sure that we pay our, our light bill, our uh, car note so that we don't lose by losing these things and getting them taken away from us instead of learning something to excel and propel above, you know, um, what we currently, many people are currently living in. I love that. I love that. And the final um, habit or secret that I'm going to share today that stands out for me is rich people have their money work hard for them while poor people work hard for their money. Um, our business coach, Patrick Bet David, something that he taught you and I years ago was that building wealth is a doubles game. And wealthy people understand that everything, every financial move that you make, it should be setting you up to double your net worth. Um, and I can speak for myself, before I got into an environment where a lot of people were making millions of dollars, um, I thought that you work hard. That's what rich people do. They just work harder than poor people. Mm -hmm. Because one of the biggest stereotypes is that poor people are lazy. Mm -hmm. Poor people are not lazy. They're working hard, man. Not when it comes to physical labor. Right. They are waking up every single morning, getting their kids off to school, driving in rush hour traffic, working eight, sometimes 12 hour days, mm -hmm. making that commute back home, cooking dinner for their kids, doing homework, taking their children to extracurricular activities, going to bed only to do it all over again. They're not lazy. The difference is poor people actually believe that you get paid for what you do. See, rich people, wealthy people understand you don't get paid for what you do. You get paid based on the size of the problem you solve in the marketplace. So you get paid for how you think. How you think will always trump what you do because if you solve a problem large enough, take the Elon Musk, the Mark Zuckerberg, the Oprah Winfrey, you solve a problem large enough, the market will respond. You can hire people and put people in key positions to do the work. You don't have to do it. You get paid for your ability to conceptualize the idea, to create the software, to create the system. Um, and so, I've completely evolved my mindset when it comes to, you know, the secrets of having a millionaire mind. By the way, the Bible also talks about God did not intend for his children to toil the land. Right. Um, that's another incredible book that we can dissect at a later time. But that book changed my life because I literally measured my worth here on earth by how hard I worked. And you would watch me mm -hmm. work hard for, for different companies. And I would think if I just do take on this extra project, Ellis, I'll get promoted. 
If I just do a little bit more, come in a little bit earlier, stay a little bit later, raise my hand and volunteer for more free projects. Right. And the reality is it did not matter because my value was wrapped into the work that I was doing. Instead of thinking that my value lies in between these both ears and my head, um, my ability to solve a problem that the market will pay massive dollars for. Man, you know what, Jasmine, it's so funny you say that because I'm reminded of a time where, you know, I thought about doing more would get me somewhere. And I remember working a job on time as a project manager and, you know, two things happened to me that I, that stuck out. One time um, I was working this project and I was reading the contract of the work that was being done. And I noticed that there was a line item that uh, I had a question about, like, do we have to do this work? I said, it doesn't seem like it based upon the contract. So I put in the RFI, which is a request for information from the client, and I asked them the question. And they said, no, you don't have to do that. And literally I had saved my company hundreds of thousand dollars from one line, one line item and one question. What do you think I got in return for that? Um, let's just say $50,000. I got nothing. I got no thank you. I got no great job. I got no, here's lunch, here's a, a, a piece on me, nothing. You know, even though they knew exactly what had happened because I had to report it. Yeah, because that was your job. My job. Here's the crazy thing, you did get something. You had the ability to keep your job for another day. And that's awesome. how employers view employees. That's right. You didn't get fired, congratulations. Good job. I think this brings me to something that's super important when we talk about a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset, right? And this is something that we had to learn as business owners. A fixed mindset says, I'll do just enough to get by. You know, um, I'm excited. I get paid every two weeks. I have my two week vacation time. I'm able to live in the neighborhood I wanna live in. I drive the car that I wanna drive. Life is okay. What is there to complain about? I'm just getting by. I'm surviving, right? right? A growth mindset consistently examines areas of improvement in their life. A growth mindset has the ability to be uncomfortable all the time. You're constantly seeking feedback, constantly seeking coaching. You wanna be held accountable. You're looking for environments that challenge you, that stretch your capacity to think, to do more, to, to evolve. And that's a growth mindset. And for most entrepreneurs, most of you watching this, maybe you're, you are an aspiring entrepreneur. Maybe you don't have your own business. Maybe you work for someone else but you are asking yourself, man, I wanna evolve my mindset. Maybe you wanna get promoted in your company. Maybe one day you wanna take over the company you're with or start your own company. How do you evolve from having that fixed to growth mindset? And something that has helped Ellis and I tremendously is by investing in our personal leadership development, making sure you have a business coach, making sure you're reading self-help books. If you wanna become a CEO, let me ask, how many books do you read a month on the way that CEOs think? How many books do you read a month on how to build a business, the blue ocean strategy? And so for a very long time, just like you guys, we didn't have an environment, we didn't have friends, family members, parents, business coaches. We made a decision to stop making excuses, to divorce a fixed mindset and say, even though nobody else around us is doing it, we have YouTube. We're gonna go find it. We're gonna stumble across a podcast called The Wealth Academy. We're gonna subscribe. We're gonna go to The Wealth Academy's website. We're gonna figure out how can we get around people like that so that we can begin to live a life of prosperity and purpose. I think a great book um, to go along with what you're saying is by Bob Iger. That's the CEO of Disney. It's called The Ride of a Lifetime. It literally talks about not having that fixed mindset. He started at the bottom of nothing worked himself all the way up throughout the year. So, you know, one day become the CEO of Disney, which he is today. Um, and so that can help you too as well, not to have that fixed mindset. Um, and the last point that I'll share today uh, is pretty powerful and I wanna read it. So I say it just the way that it's written because it's so powerful. Rich people act in spite of fear. Poor people let fear stop them. And let's dissect fear, right? Uh, and you may have heard this before, but a lot of people always say it is false evidence appearing real. 
And if we go deep and dive into deeper into the word, it says fear is not of the Lord, it is of the devil, right? And so many times you've been given the idea, you've been given the opportunity, you've been given the space to do something different, but fear grips you to not move forward. Guys, I didn't know anything about the life insurance industry. I didn't know anything about sales. I didn't know anything about talking and communicating with people. If you ask some of my friends from years, years ago and just who they knew me, who I used to be, they would say that boy Ellis don't talk to nobody. Right, he would stand in the room, he would be in the corner, he wouldn't talk to anybody unless you knew. Now people who know me say, well, he's not really quiet, but in a, a, a setting and environment where I didn't know people, I wasn't that open just to go up and talk to people, right? And so if a person like myself could overcome all of, because they were fears, by the way, I'm not saying that I didn't have them, I'm saying, but I was gonna make sure that that fear didn't stop me from winning in life. Because if a kid from New Orleans who was raised by a single mom was a teen parent, who grew up eating commodity cheese and bologna sandwiches and had cockroaches in the house, could it, could one day be sitting here talking to you about the successes that we have, you can too. Don't sit here and look at us and then look at me and think that I didn't have fear, but I was just like, those, those fears are not gonna stop me. And there's three things when you think about fear, is flight, freeze, and fight, right? And so there are three reactions to fear. Flight is you flee from it, right, you gone. All right. Freeze is you just like a deer in headlights. You don't know what to do. It stops you and you do nothing. You're paralyzed. But then there's that fight. And that's what I had. I had that fight to say, nope. My grandmother told me I ruined my life. I said, nope, I'm a fight. When I was sitting in college and I had a, a, a what you call that jazz when we talk about the um, uh, uh, not feeling like we belong in that. This um, imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. I had the imposter syndrome in college thinking, Ellis, who do you think that you are that you can become an engineer? Who do you think that you are you can become an electrical engineer? You don't know this stuff. You're not smart enough. This map doesn't even have numbers anymore. This is all Greek letters. You can't yeah, do this. I know I'd have had to drop that. <laughs> I'm right? for the calculator, okay? I am for the calculator. You're for the calculator. You know, we didn't have chat GPT. Shoot, boy, Chad GPT in college, man, straight A's, right? But anyway, <laughs> anyway, you know, I, I had those things at end, but I said, no, I'm gonna fight. You know, I'm not gonna say that every single time that I didn't have a, a, a fear, a, a freeze moment or a flight moment, but all you can do is get up the next day and try again. And that's what entrepreneurs have, yep. right? When they fall down, they get back up, Like right? They realize the error, they say, nope, I'm not going to just go back because at this point, at that point, I was like, well, what am I going to go back to? Am I going to go back to the golden handcuffs? Am I going to go back to making somebody else's dream a reality? Or am I going to fight for my dream, fight for my reality, fight for my family, fight for my legacy, fight for my last name? And that's what I hope that, that you guys watching today and any day, whether no matter what time it is, it could be two o'clock in the morning when you're watching this, I hope it empowers you to get up and fight and not live a life of fear. I love that. So I guess the only question we have left is, what are you fighting for? Are you fighting right now in life? Are you flighting or are you freezing? Comment below. We definitely want to hear from you. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you aren't already. Be sure to like this episode. Share this with someone who you believe has a fighter inside of them. Um, and also pick up the book Secrets of a Millionaire Mind. We would love to hear your biggest secrets, your biggest takeaways, um, because this is a book that has completely transformed our lives, guys. Um, don't forget to visit our website. We love to have you join the Academy, become an agent, become a client. Uh, we're, we're growing and we're looking for you. So until next time, let wealth and purpose drive you to prosperity. Have a good one, guys.